being here tonight. Uh, our um, uh, presenter is uh, Nicholas St. Sevier from Cortese Tree Specialist. He's the district manager of the Cortese Tree. I know a lot of folks uh, may uh, know of Jim Cortese, who, who has uh, moved on from the Cortese Tree Specialist Company and, and uh, Nick has now kind of been in that role for several years now, has been doing a tremendous job. Uh, I hired him last year to cable a couple trees in my own yard and uh, did an excellent job at pruning and doing a very professional job as well. But uh, he's a uh, certified arborist and a board certified master arborist as well uh, through the International Society of Arboriculture. Uh, I will... As a former employee of the Davy Tree Company, I was a, a, a Davy Institute of Tree Science uh, graduate, which is a, a small little uh, class that they put together, that company puts together each year, and they bring in arborists from all around the country to do specialized training. And uh, Nick, I, I don't want to brag on you a little bit, but from my understanding, you were the Golden Oak Award the year you uh, went there. So uh, he's... It's kind of like the top gun of Davy Tree, so uh, uh, he's big stuff. So, uh, anyways, he's an expert. He's great, knowledgeable, and uh, and he's going to talk tonight about uh, reproduction of trees. One of my favorite topics because it's so interesting and just how the different uh, trees reproduce out there and and how it all works. And uh, it's something that I think that we very rarely see because it happens so quickly in the overall entire year. Um, you know, things reproduce and, and we see the flowers and we're going on some things we may not even realize we're looking at the flowers. So with that, Nick, I'm going to turn it over to you and stop talking. Um, and, uh, and Tracy Hellwinkle's here as well. She's recording this. And if there are any questions, please, um, Put them in the chat box, and I'm sure Nick will make time at the end for any kind of Q&A as well. So, uh, again, appreciate everyone being here. Again, this is the uh, 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 series put together by the Tree Board, and they put speakers together just trying to get, continue some education opportunities for folks in the public. And uh, uh, looking forward to hearing Nick talk tonight. So, Nick, it's all you. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. Uh, so, let me get in here. Share my screen. Um, so thanks for uh, uh, everyone joining us tonight. I'm glad to see there's so much interest in uh, these sorts of topics, um, especially here in Knoxville. Um, I feel like most people here have a great appreciation for the outdoors and everything. So um, anytime we can sit down and talk and have conversations about nature and um, how trees and plants work and everything. I'm always, always glad to do that. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, sexual reproduction in plants. Um, I know that this could be a somewhat dry topic and it's, um, if you're not careful. So um, I'm going to basically just kind of skirt on the edges of a lot of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about bloom anatomy, um, different types of, um, different types of, uh, trees and male and female, monoecious and dioecious, that sort of thing. And then we're gonna talk about uh, pollinators. Um, so some things to keep in mind, uh, there are a lot of different types of reproduction in plants. Um, tonight, we're only gonna focus on sexual reproduction. Um, there's a lot of other ways that trees do reproduce and reproduce such as rhizomes and corms and that sort of thing through asexual reproduction, but we're mainly actually only gonna focus on sexual reproduction tonight. So um, I did a lot of research for this um, and learned a lot. So I hope everybody here can learn as much as I did um, when I was researching this topic. Um, it's not one of those things that Casey or myself or really anybody uses on a day-to-day -day basis unless you're a botanist, which I'm not, um, but like I said, hopefully we could all take a little bit away from this and um, have some sort of higher level of appreciation towards uh, trees and plants and uh, especially blooms and flowers and pollinators and just nature in general. So, um, so some things to keep in mind again is there's over 350,000 flowering plants in the world. Um, and uh, like I said, there's 
we don't have enough time to go over every single one of those. So we're just going to touch on basic concepts this evening. Um, also, another thing to keep in mind is all plants that have seeds have some sort of flower. Um, we got to keep in mind that the reproductive structure of a plant is a flower. So anytime you stick your nose in a, a flower to smell it, you're sticking it in the reproductive organs of a plant. Um, and we're going to take a look at that here on the next slide. Um, so let me see. I think there's a way I could get a laser pointer here so I can point out some things. Okay, so the bloom anatomy, um, some things that I just really want to focus on. Like I said, we're not going to dive too deep into this, but just some things for uh, basic knowledge and some things and concepts that I'm going to be repeating through this uh, presentation are, through, again, reproductive organs. So um, with a flower, um, everybody's familiar with what that looks like. Um, I want to mainly focus on the stamens and let's see if I hide that. Cool. Uh, the stamens and the pistils. Uh, the stamen are basically the male reproductive organs, which consists of the filament, um, which basically supports the anther. Uh, the anther produces the pollen uh, for, uh, for the plant, uh, which we're going to take a closer look into that here in the next slide. Over on the right hand side, um, or I guess I shouldn't say over on the right hand side, but in the middle, you can see what we call the pistil. Uh, and that's the female reproductive organs on a flower. Uh, at the very top, you have a stigma, which collects the pollen. Um, and then what's supported, what supports that is what we call the style. Um, and that connects to the ovary, um, which actually holds the eggs. And, um, uh, actually, uh, I should say the eggs, but the seeds of the plant. Uh, so let's see, Oop, there we go. Uh, so <clears throat> first one I want to talk about is the male organs. Um, as I've mentioned, you've got two parts that are important for um, the, the male reproductive organs. So you've got the filament, which again supports the anther. Um, the anther supports or holds the pollen. And once the anther, <clears throat> excuse me, once the anther um, matures and the pollen matures, uh, it, it'll split releasing the pollen. And there's a bunch of different ways uh, to where that pollen is released. And we'll look at a lot of those examples tonight um, and a lot of different ways that that pollen, I shouldn't say a lot of ways that the pollen is released, but a lot of different ways that that pollen is carried from the anther to uh, the stigma on the female portions of the flower. So um, once it matures, uh, you've got these lines that just pop open, releasing the pollen. Um, and we'll go into that here in a little bit, a little bit more. So uh, next one I wanna discuss, and we really don't focus a whole lot on is pollen. And I was surprised when I was doing research for this, how much research actually goes into pollen. I mean, there's books and books and research papers and research papers upon about pollen. So if you're really interested in it, um, there's a lot of resources out there and that are available for you to, to look at. Um, but what I just wanna focus your attention on tonight is um, you've got your pollen grain um, and you've got basically two things that are important for reproduction when it comes to plants. You've got your generative nucleus, which basically has uh, the sperm in it. And then you've got the tube nucleus, which will uh, form the conduit from the stigma down through the style into the ovary. Um, and that will allow for your generative or your sperm cells to actually travel from the very tip of that stigma all the way down in the ovary. Uh, to fertilize one of the seeds. Uh, so looking at the entire life cycle um, or most of the life cycle, basically, once that pollen lands on the stigma, um, it will, at a certain temperature, it will trigger a reaction for your pollen tube to be initiated, which you can see here in the second picture. Um, and once that pollen tube is initiated, uh, it grows incredibly quickly. It's actually one of the fastest growing 
um, one of the fastest growing cells um, in the in nature. Um, it can actually grow up to a half an inch per hour, which is incredibly incredibly quick when you think of how small a grain of pollen is um, and how much resources and how much energy actually has to be stored up in a single grain of pollen for it to grow, you know, whether it's an inch, two inches, six inches, all the way down into um, the actual ovary of the, of the, uh, of the plant. So um, once the pollen tube is activated, the two sperm cells fall right behind um, and the pollen tube is blocked to prevent the sperm from actually going back up um, and is basically deposited in the embryo, um, which something called um, uh, double pollination, uh, or excuse me, double fertilization occurs, which we're not going to get into. That's a pretty complicated subject, um, but uh, we, like I said, just don't need to get into that tonight. So once that happens, uh, your basically your seeds will begin to form, um, and the rest of the flower will sometimes fall off, um, and your fruit uh, is actually formed from the ovary. Um, so if you're eating like an apple, that's the ovary, um, which then contains the seeds. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, plant sexuality. Um, so there's different types of plants. I know we just looked at a flower and uh, that flower was considered a perfect flower. So it had both male and female organs on a single bloom. That's not always the case when it comes to trees or shrubs. Um, we've got three different categories, which are basically dioecious, monoecious, and then you've got bisexual plants. Uh, your dioecious plants, they have male and female plants, kind of like ginkgos. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the, the ginkgo, female ginkgos that produce that really stinky, smelly fruit. Um, and most people don't want that. Uh, persimmons are another good example. And we're going to look a little bit more into some of these um, here in a little bit. Uh, the other one would be monoecious plants. Um, and that's a plant that holds either bisexual flowers or basically perfect flowers on it, or um, you've got plants that have both male and female reproductive organs on different flowers. So you could have two types of imperfect flowers on one plant um, for fertilization. So uh, we're gonna take first explore the monoecious plants. Um, monoecious literally means one house. Um, so again, your male and re female reproductive organs are gonna be staged on one plant. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to pollinate itself, um, but you're not going to have male and female plants. So you don't really have to worry about it uh, if you're worried about making a mess in your yard or something like that. Uh, most trees and shrubs actually fall into this category. Um, all monoecious plants produce fruit and seed. Um, they're, most of your nut bearing trees actually fall into this category and they could have either perfect or imperfect flowers. Um, some examples, which we're gonna get into are like birch, oak, dogwood, uh, fig, most nut trees, sweet gum, and hemlocks. So uh, this, uh, here's a picture of a birch. And again, it's a monoecious plant. And uh, I was, actually when I was doing research for this, I went out into the yard and was looking at some of our oak trees because they were in bloom at the time. And I'm um, trying to figure out, and I, I honestly didn't realize this until I started doing a lot more research, but your male portions are, and this, and you see this in the next slide too with your, um, with your oaks, but uh, basically your male portions of the uh, reproductive structures are your catkins, which are right here. They hang down. Um, in a birch, they actually are pollinated by wind. Um, so they hang down and just release pollen into the air as those anthers actually mature. Um, sticking up top though, um, these are your stigmas um, and they actually collect the pollen. Um, and 
Uh, so that's a female reproductive organ on a birch tree, river birch, yellow birch, anything like that. Uh, next one we're going to look at is oak. Um, so oak is another really good example. You've got catkins that hang down. Um, a couple months ago, or about a month ago, um, these were all falling off the tree. And uh, they look, kind of look like tumbleweed when they fall off the tree. <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand what they are, but they are the male reproductive organs. Um, so you look at this and you're like, okay, I see the catkins, that's male reproductive organs, but where's the female reproductive organs if they're, um, if they're actually monoecious? So if you look right here, um, this is actually the uh, stigma of the, um, of the oak tree. So that's your female reproductive organ. I think there's another one like right here. It's kind of hard to see in this picture. Um, and then it looks like there's a few more sprinkled in here. So these will actually turn into acorns once they're uh, completely fertilized. Uh, next tree I wanted to look at, or we're gonna look at is a dogwood. Um, so this is a dogwood bloom. And again, it's monoecious and it's got perfect flowers. Um, so on this guy, you've got your anthers right here, 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 and here. Um, and right here is your uh, stigma, so that's the female portion of it. So that's what's actually going to uh, hold on to the pollen. Um, that pollen is going to travel down the style uh, through that pollen tube. And then your ovaries right here. Um, so your seeds will be produced out of there. Um, these right here are, are the petals of a dogwood. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a lot of people look at this picture and they're like, I think a lot of people would look at this picture and say, that's definitely not a dogwood bloom. I know what a dogwood bloom looks like, um, but this is the entire bloom of a dogwood. Um, a lot of people, when they think of dogwoods, they think of a picture more like this. And these white petals, and I put that in air quotes, these white petals are actually called bracts and they're modified leaf. Um, so they're not actual uh, petals on a, on a flat earth. Um, it's actually, and you can see it pretty well in this picture though, too. So right here, you've got one single flower. Um, and this little thing right here that my pointer is over is the petal. These are bracts. Um, and, they, and they do help to attract insects to this flower um, and make a landing platform for them. So um, again, looking at the entire picture or an entire bloom, you've got the anther right here. Um, and then it's easier to tell here, but so you got anther surrounded these little tan areas and then the very center of that green part is the stigma. So that's what's actually going to capture the pollen, um, transport it down into the ovary. And that's where your seed or your little berries are gonna show up from uh, later on this year. So um, interesting thing about Brax is that they're actually more they're probably closer related to thorns because thorns on a, like a rose bush are modified leaves as well. So these bracts are more closely related to that or thorns than they are actually flower petals. Um, another plant that has bracts, which most of us are familiar with are poinsettias. Um, so this, this Christmas, uh, you kind of missed dogwood blooms this year, but this Christmas you could look at your poinsettias and in the very center you have something very similar to this, where you have a cluster of flowers surrounded by those red bracts. Um, Euphorbia is another plant that uh, tends to have bracts as well instead of actual flowers, um, or I shouldn't say actual flowers. They have flowers, but they're surrounded by bracts instead of uh, petals. Uh, next one that is pretty interesting are your fig trees. And um, I didn't learn this until we listened to our presentation a uh, couple months ago. And uh, she posed the question of what does a fig tree blossom look like? And um, most of us think of figs and like, if you, if you think about a fig tree, you just don't think of, you know, when, when do they actually bloom? Um, it's a good question, but fig trees, um, you've got the, the actual figs themselves are inverted flowers. Um, so what you're eating is a flower, um, which stores the seeds and sides. So 
Um, we don't actually eat the fruit on a fig tree. Well, we do, but it's inside um, in their little tiny seeds, but we're mainly eating and the sweet part is a fig tree, it is the actual fig itself. Um, so to give you a better understanding of that, I've got a cross section of a fig, um, which does a much better job about illustrating it than I was just able to do just speaking words. But um, so you've got inside of a fig, you've got your seeds, and this is actually the fruit of a fig. Um, and then you've got your female uh, reproductive organs, your anther or your stigma, excuse me. Um, these are actually already matured, so um, you won't have them on here, but all your male flowers are right here. And that's going to be important to keep in mind later on. Um, and we're going to look at this picture later on as well, because um, it's, it's a very interesting cycle on how this pollen gets to um, actually pollinating these or fertilizing these um, seeds. So we'll take a little closer look at that later. But on the inside, keep in mind, you've got your anthers here, male reproductive organs, female reproductive organs here. Um, this little wasp is important for the pollination of it, but like I said, we'll look at that here in a little bit. So next plants that we're gonna look at are dioecious plants and dioecious literally means uh, two houses. Um, so that means that you're gonna have both male and, re both male and female uh, plants. So that's gonna be like your ginkgos, your persimmon, mulberries, um, Kentucky coffee tree, that sort of thing. So um, it can have, or they have imperfect flowers on two separate plants. Um, and keep in mind that only females have, have the fruit. So if you've got a yard and you're looking to plant a tree of some sort, and you don't wanna deal with the mess, um, uh, then you're gonna to wanna to look for male cultivars and varieties of those, of those plants. So the first one, uh, first example we're gonna look at is your persimmon. Um, so here on the left-hand side, you're going to see the male flower and on the right hand side you're going to see your female flower um, if you look at the very central center so you've got your petal petals on the outside on both of these um, and on, on the inside um, these are your anthers so they're what's that's what's going to actually release and pr or produce and release uh, pollen on the right hand side your female flowers you've got your anthers are all sticking out um, and that's what's going to hold on to the grab onto the pollen and fertilize um, uh, fertilize the ovary. Another interesting thing about persimmons is that if you're trying to sex them, um, you can do it early on, especially if you can't get close enough to the flowers to actually see if they've got anthers and stigmas. Is if you look at the base of them, uh, your persimmon trees they've got really really swollen sepals at the base of them. Um, compared to your male flowers that don't have as pronounced sepals um, at the base of them. So if you can't get close enough, you can look up, just look for the swelling. If you got really pronounced sepals, more than likely you've got a girl. Uh, next one we're gonna look at are mulberries. Mulberries are really interesting because they've got male and female trees as well. Um, so your male trees are over here and I know this picture is kind of fuzzy, um, but you could kind of see the anthers sticking out. Um, you've got that line where it actually pops open and releases that pollen. And then over here on the right hand side, you've got your female flowers again. Um, and these are what's actually going to hold on to and grab onto that pollen. The interesting thing about mulberries is that when they undergo um, periods of uh, incredible stress, they do have the ability to actually revert to the opposite sex. They're one of the few trees that can do that. Um, so if you have a male tree uh, for a long, long time, you never get fruit and the thing's 30, 40, 50 years old, um, which is old for a mulberry, but, um, and all of a sudden it just starts putting out a fruit, um, it, it may have reverted and changed its sex um, because of something that happened. It could be either uh, construction damage or severe drought or um, anything like that. So um, I've had, had that happen to, to clients and um, but they ended up getting, um, having the trees cut down because they were, they could just be so messy, mul mulberries can. So 
Uh, next one that most of us are very familiar with, um, and this was another one that I wasn't all that familiar with the uh, reproductive organs on, but now that I see it, I could, um, it would be pretty easy to identify it. Um, so your male is on the left, female on the right. Um, they've got catkins, just like your oak trees do, um, but they don't have the female portions, the stigma sticking up on the top. So um, the stigmas are going to be on a totally separate tree. Um, again, these are going to latch onto the pollen. This is your, um, your, uh, uh, not pollen tube, your, uh, and no, I'm sorry, I forgot the word for it, but, um, but basically, uh, your ovary is going to be down here. And when your pollen tube forms, you can see how far it has to go. And it makes that journey in just a couple hours. Um, and you're talking something like you could barely even see and some something that has enough energy stored up in it. That's very, very, very small. So you can imagine how small that actual pollen tube is that's going to carry that the sperm down into the ovary. Uh, next one we're going to look at is the Kentucky coffee tree. Um, so Kentucky coffee trees, anybody that has them and they have females, they know that they get those really big brown coffee beans that you can't mulch. I mean, they're worse than magnolia flowers. They've got them over at the Knoxville Botanical Gardens, um, and they've actually got female uh, Kentucky coffee trees over there. But you can't mulch them. You just got to pick them up, get rid of them. They're just so hard to, to deal with. So if you want a Kentucky coffee tree um, and you don't want the mess, you want to make sure that you've got a male, um, male Kentucky coffee tree, which you can see over here. Again, anthers are pretty obvious on here. Your uh, stigma in the very center right here. Um, so you've got your male, female uh, on two separate, two separate plants. So next thing uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about pollinators. And there's several different ways that trees can actually get pollinated. Um, one is uh, through wind, uh, which we'll take a look at that here on the next slide. Uh, flies actually do a lot of pollinating. The obvious ones like bees and wasps, uh, butterflies and moths. Again, those are pretty obvious ones that everybody's very familiar with. Um, and then you've got beetles which when you think of pollinators, you really don't think of beetles, but there are certain species of plants that rely on beetles for pollination and quite heavily and have for a very, very, very long time. Um, and then you've got mammals such as hummingbirds, bats, et cetera. Um, so the examples that we're gonna look at, um, they aren't necessarily 100% pollinator specific. Um, so they're not going to, it's not gonna be like, a one size fits all like you know if we look at a dogwood excuse me it's not going to be like this one one uh way of pollination is the only way it gets pollinated there's kind of a mixture nature's pretty good about doing that um and that's just for survival of the fittest or not survival of the fittest but just having multiple ways to reproduce um or spread its pollen just ensures the um long-term sustained long-term success of that species of plants. Um, so uh, a good example for that or good analogy to, to look at is um, everybody's heard you can't fit a square peg into a, a circle hole. Um, but you, if your square peg is small enough, you can fit it in a circle hole. It's not going to have the most amount of surface area. So it may not be most effective. Um, but you can still kind of make it work. Um, and most, the reason why I bring that up is because most trees and shrubs, they have very specific pollination methods that work best for them. Um, another interesting thing is that uh, the scientists estimate that there's 200,000 to 350,000 different animal species that assist with pollination. So um, it's not um, these are just broad coverings of those. So you've got different species of beetles, different species of bees and wasps and butterflies and moss. So there's a lot of pollination that happens from a lot of things that we might not even necessarily think about. 
Uh, so first one we're going to look at is uh, wind pollination. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but the fancy term for it, if anybody wants to know, is anemophily. Um, it makes up about 10% of all pollination. And most of your nut bearing trees, such as walnut, pecan, oak, um, are going to fall into this category. And then most of your conifers as well. So like your hemlock, juniper, and pine. Um, most everybody, um, and Lee, Lee Rumble actually has a really good picture of a juniper earlier this year, or an eastern red cedar, that uh, was re releasing a copious amount of, of pollen. And we're going to take a video or look at a video here in a second to show you how much pollen um, one single tree can actually hold. Um, and that's kind of their strategy. When, when you're dealing with something that's wind pollinated, their strategy is just to release as much pollen as they possibly can. Um, they don't do anything fancy. They don't need nectar. They just release and produce as much pollen as they can and hope that it lands on um, a female portion of a, another tree um, for reproduction. So um, some other things about uh, flowers, uh, I put that in air quotes, on trees that are pollinated by the wind is that there's there's nothing really special about it. There's no bright colors. There's no special odors. There's no nectar, um, anything like that, because it's just a waste of energy for those plants to produce those sorts of things. Um, they just put it all into the pollen, produce as much as they can, and let it go. Um, generally, the pollen is going to be really, really tiny on it. Um, again, that's just so that the wind can catch it. It doesn't have to be super heavy because it's not being dragged around by uh, you know, mammals and insects and that sort of things. Uh, they're not going to have petals. Um, the stamens and stigmas are exposed to air currents. Um, and then uh, usually they have single seeded fruits, such as, like I said, oak, birch, poplar, all that stuff. So um, we're going to take a look at this video. I can remember how to do that. Um, so right here. Uh, is a picture of that. Hopefully you guys are seeing a YouTube um, YouTube picture or video. Uh, if not, let me know. Um, but this tree, I think it's a hemlock. So again, it's a conifer that falls into that anemophily category. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to cut this tree down and just drop it over to your left. And you see all the pollen that's act actually released. So it's just a quick video. There it goes. Um, it's just a huge dust of pollen. Um, now every year, and I'm sure some of you are just like sneezing and think that's terrible and wish I didn't show that video, but um, it's it doesn't necessarily hold on to that much pollen at any given time or every single year. Um, what will... Uh, end up happening is when you have years like what we did this year where it was kind of dry, kind of cool. I um, mean, you had a slow oncoming of those, um, of those, uh, of the pollen, it'll hold it and it won't drop it until you get some strong winds or something like that, or you drop the tree um, or bump into it. And then you just get this huge cl cloud of, of pollen. So this year, um, was a really bad year for cedar fever, um, which again, I was talking to Lee Rumble about because uh, he was showing me videos of, of some cedar trees releasing their pollen and it, like I said, it'll about make you sneeze just by looking at it. So um, that's what anemophily is. Um, I don't really have anything else regarding that. So um, next one we're going to look at are your flies. And a lot of people, when they think of flies, they don't think of them as pollinators. They think of them as um, something that will actually, that does uh, decomposing in the environment, which they, they do do that, especially in the larval stages. Um, so they generally think of like dead, decaying flesh, uh, manure, that sort of thing. Um, but there are some species of plants that rely on flies for pollination. Um, and again, you think of a fly and you're like, well, how effective of a, of a pollinator can it actually be? This is a great, great example 
of um, just how effective they, they actually can be. Um, most insects have these little hairs on them, which are really good for carrying pollen. Um, and as you can see this, um, I don't know what kind of fly, a blue bottle fly um, is what this guy is. And he's got a bunch of hairs, a bunch of pollen he's holding on to. And one thing to keep in mind as well is that when you're looking at an insect that's covered with pollen or hair on it, um, and that, that may not be the right terminology, but when you've got all these little hairs on them, wherever that hair is most um, concentrated uh, is generally how that insect is going to pollinate. So um, we'll look into some of those examples a little later on as we're looking at like the beetles and the honeybees um, and just how, how they pollinate compared to a fly. So flies are just kind of covered with it. Um, but it's mainly accumulated on the bottom, so they're going to pollinate by crawling over stuff um, or insects, or not insects, but plants and that sort of thing. Um, generally, your flies are going to be attracted to darker colored uh, flowers and um, flowers that actually stink um, for somewhat obvious reasons. Um, like I said, most of us, when we think of flies, we think of decaying tissue and manure and that sort of thing. So flowers and different plants will replicate those, uh, those scents and smells and, and aromas and whatnot to attract things like flies to them. Uh, so uh, one plant that uh, your flies do pollinate is our trillium. Um, they do and specifically like the copper trillium, um, not necessarily the yellow ones, but the copper trilliums do release a somewhat stinky smell to them and they are and do rely on flies for pollination and then they do rely on ants for seed dispersal. Um, so that's one great example. You see this guy crawling up in here, um, just kind of crawling around and again as the previous slide showed, um, that's how they tend to pollinate. They're going to carry the pollen underneath. So uh, plants are really, really interesting um, in their, if I can use this term, intelligence um, and their manipulation of insects and uh, animals around them to get them to reproduce for them. Um, and this is a, a classic example. Uh, next one we're going to look at, and um, I wasn't even sure what uh, this bloom was, um, or what, because this is a pawpaw bloom, but I didn't even know what a pawpaw bloom really looked like until earlier this year. I've never seen one in person um, until I was on one of my client's um, properties. And uh, pawpaws are a little annoying, um, especially when doing research on them, because there's some sources that say they're monoecious, and then there's others that say they're dioecious. Um, but it's my understanding, and what makes most sense to me is that pawpaws are, uh, are pro prodigious, uh, basically meaning that they have both male and female reproductive organs on every flower, but each stamen, um, so these little fuzzy things right here, um, is going to open at a different time. Um, I'm sorry, the stamen's in the middle. Um, but so it'll basically prevent self-pollination um, and actually requires a totally separate tree um, to pollinate. So anybody that's worked with pawpaws know that they could be really finicky um, in regards to actually getting them to produce fruit. Um, and if you look in here again, you could see the, the stigmas in the very center. These ones are nice and glossy. So it appears to me that they're able to receive pollen um, and then after that, they're actually, um, the anthers will mature and release the pollen for other flowers to actually be pollinated. Um, as I uh, stated just a few seconds ago, pawpaws, they need uh, pollen from a different plant to actually produce fruit, which again, makes them kind of finicky. And the frustrating part about that is if you have a pawpaw patch and you're not getting any fruit, um, that could mean that you have one single pawpaw 
but it suckered and form, formed a little colony. Um, so if you aren't getting any fruit and you've had your pawpaw for 10, 15, 20 years, um, it would be good to introduce another cultivar of a pawpaw um, to help actually fertilize uh, the one that you have. Um, a really good example actually um, of pawpaws in bloom and actually producing fruit is um, actually over in Victor Ash Park. Um, as you can see here, you've got a fly on this paw, pawpaw bloom. Um, they've got the dark colors on it, just like that trillium that we just looked at. So they're gonna attract flies. But if you go to Victor Ash Park, um, they've, that, there's a, a greenway that, that borders Cumberland horse stables. And if you walk down there here in a few months, you'll see a bunch of pawpaws. And I attribute a lot of that for um, having those horse stables right there. It's a good location for the pawpaws. You've got a bunch of them, but you've also got a lot of flies flying around as well. Um, so if you wanna see pawpaws, that, that's a really good place to go um, uh, to, to have a look at them. Uh, next one we're gonna look at, and for everybody that likes chocolate, which it's probably everybody on this talk, um, this may give you a new appreciation towards towards flies um, because chocolate is actually pollinated by this little guy. It's called a chocolate midge um, and it, it is a type of fly. You see all the little hairs and everything on them uh, that collects pollen. Um, if you look at, if we look at the next slide, um, that's the actual bloom of a uh, chocolate flower. And they're pretty interesting as well because um, under these little hoods right here, you can see the anthers, so the male portion of it. Um, and then you've got the female portion right here. Now, I'm not 100% sure how um, the pollination occurs on this. Um, I was doing a bunch of research, couldn't find it. Um, but if you look back on this little guy, you got a bunch of hairs on the top. Um, and then same thing on this little guy. I'm, that looks like one, I'm not 100% positive, but looks like he's carrying some sort of pollen. Um, so this guy walking around, brushing around on all the inside of this will, um, will actually pollinate your cocoa trees. And the other interesting part about the cocoa midge is that they're one of the few things that can actually pollinate um, our, our chocolate supply. So um, if we lose chocolate midges, um, we're going to have a lot of issues with actually producing chocolate and, you know, one of our most loved foods or could potentially go away. Um, the other interesting thing about the cocoa midge is that their entire life cycle only lasts about 30 days. Um, they spend about 14 days as a larvae. Um, after that 14 days, they form a little cocoon. They spend three days in that cocoon and then they hatch um, or come out of that cocoon and then they have 10 days as an adult which they do all their pollination um, and then all their breeding and then they and they end up dying like most flies do um, you know most flies don't have a long lifespan so it's a constant renewal um, and it, there's got to be a constant supply and breeding of cocoa midges in order for them to be successful and uh, for our chocolate um, chocolate trees to be successful as well. Um, so you basically get one generation per month on your chocolate uh, chocolate midges. Um, next one we're going to look at is hoverfly. And a lot of people are familiar with these. They call them good news bees. Um, the, uh, looking at this picture, you look at that and you're like, well, that doesn't look fuzzy at all. Like how, how is that going to carry any pollen? Um, the next slide we're going to show is it'll show how fuzzy um, hoverflies actually are. Um, hoverflies are that color to replicate bees um, to try to keep other insects away from them and um, uh, disguise themselves as something that they shouldn't be eating, even though they are a pretty easy catch and whatnot. So um, if you look at this picture as well, um, I don't know if anybody knows what kind of bloom that that little hoverfly is standing on, but that is a bread for pear. Um, bread for pears, every, I think everybody knows this. They reek um, about a month ago um, or early in the spring. They just absolutely reek. And 
Um, if you want one more reason to hate Bradford pear, um, like I do, um, they are pollinated by flies. Um, and they do a pretty good job about it. Obviously, if you look around Knoxville, especially in the spring, there's just all over the interstates, they're just super invasive, um, and pop up all over the place. So, um, so kind of moving on the hoverfly, taking a closer look at this little guy. Um, you can see all the little hair sticking up on them, kind of like a honeybee, actually. We've got a ton of hair on them. Um, which is really effective for holding on to and grabbing onto pollen. Um, you can see a little pollen down here on its legs. Um, and so as it's walking over um, uh, flowers and that sort of thing, it's, it's pollinated, dropping um, this pollen on stigmas and, and helping out with pollination. So, um, you know, flies definitely, we don't want to dis disregard them. Um, a lot of people think about, again, just honeybees when it comes to uh, pollination, but flies do play a crucial role in the environment um, and are important for certain, certain uh, pollination or certain plants to be pollinated like um, what we've discussed already. So the next one we're going to look at are our honeybees. Um, our well, not our honeybees, but bees and wasps. And bees typically like um, blooms that are full of nectar. Um, they're generally going to be more brightly colored uh, with petals that are usually blue or yellow or a mixture of these. Um, bees really do like blue. So if you're allergic to bees, it's probably not a good idea to wear blue. Um, they're going to have a, a more uh, sweetly aromatic scent to them. Um, instead of like the, the pungent smell of uh, that which flies are attracted to. Um, they're going to be open during the daytime. Typically, they're going to provide landing platforms for that bee to actually come in and land. Um, you know, bees are kind of big um, and kind of heavy, so especially for a little delicate bloom. So they're going to have some sort of landing platform, which we'll look at an example of that. Um, and then... Um, or they're going to have like a bunch of flowers um, to where, again, it's going to provide a really nice landing platform. So if you look at this picture, uh, bees are really effective pollinators, and this is why we pay so much attention to them. And it's because they're so furry um, or so fuzzy that they hold a lot of pollen every time they go to visit something. They're picking up pollen from all over the place, but they also have these pollen sacks um, that they, they transport as well. I um, mean, they actually use that for um, a source of protein. They bring that back to the nest um, and, and use it for, uh, for food. Um, another thing I wanted to mention too is, um, and a lot of people don't realize this because when we think about pollinators and trying to protect our pollinators, they, we all immediately think of honeybees, but the honeybees that we used here in the United States are actually European honeybees. So they weren't here before the settlers came in. Um, so the only reason why I bring that up is because it kind of forces you to think about, you know, what was here first and what was doing all the pollination here in the United States before these European honeybees came in and did that. You know, there were all kinds of other species that were here doing that sort of pollination. And as I mentioned um, earlier in this presentation that there's um, what, 350,000 different species that actually contribute to pollination. So um, I love honeybees, but it's not the only thing that we really need to be focusing on when we're talking about pollination and just saving, saving the honeybees. There's a lot of other things that come into consideration um, that, that we need to consider as well. And that includes flies and beetles and that sort of thing. So as I mentioned before, we're gonna take a look at the fig. I'll give you the entire life cycle of a, a fig. Um, it is actually pollinated by a wasp. And I'm not sure if we have these here in the United States, but I would assume that we do. But basically what ends up happening is your wasp, um, you have a, excuse me, a, uh, a fertilized wasp, female wasp come in. It'll crawl through the bottom of the fig. There's a little opening there. And it'll layer its eggs inside that fig. And uh, that 
that wasp will, will die in that fig. And what will end up happening is your eggs will stay in there. The males will hatch first um, and they will fertilize the females before they hatch. And the importance of that is that the males are normally flightless, but they have enlarged man mandibles. So they can come in, fertilize the females, they can gnaw through the fig and make little galleries as you see here for the females to escape. Um, so once the females hatch, um, they're called through the inside of the fig, picking up pollen, all that sort of thing, fly off, visit the, another fig, and the process just repeats itself. Um, here's that picture I was, we were looking at earlier, um, and you can see that at the very base of the fig um, is that little hole that we were talking about. And anybody that's turned a fig over, they, they know exactly uh, what that looks like. Um, and they crawl on in through here. Um, and then it's difficult for them to escape uh, once they're actually in there and they're just come in, lay all their eggs and um, basically complete their life cycle inside of a fig. That does mean that if you are eating figs, you are eating uh, little baby wasps um, as well. So um, if you wanna gross out your friends, that may be one to um, share with them. Um, they're not the big wasps that sting you um, and they're not threatening to humans or anything like that, but they do, they are a type of wasp. Um, next one we're gonna look at is our carpenter bees. And this is a native bee species. Um, and a lot of people dread these guys and try to kill them and um, just destroy them. And uh, because of all the damage and havoc they can actually cause on houses and structures and that sort of thing. Um, but you can see from this picture um, how effective and how much pollen uh, this little carpenter bee is picking up. You see how fuzzy he is. Um, he's got fuzz all over him. You got a really nice pollen load up here, um, which he'll take out to the next one and uh, continue to fertilize. Um, this is actually a passion flower um, or, or passiflora, either, either or. Um, it is native and they do kind of take over. I've got some in my yard that I just let come back because they are so good for pollinators. And there are some um, insects that do use them as host plants. Um, but this is a really good example of a flower that does a really good job about manipulating insects uh, for its own good and for its reproduction. Um, and I'm gonna show you picture, the next picture, um, because if you look at this, You've got your anthers here, which is your male portion, which is releasing the pollen. And then you've got your female portion, the stigma up here. And you look at that and you're like, well, how does, if he's just crawling around here, um, how, is, how is pollen gonna get up on the stigma? Well, pa passion flowers do something really interesting. And that is, if you look at this picture, you can see these stigmas are now down. So it's probably later in the day that this picture was taken. Um, again, if you go back, oops, go back, there we go. Um, so if you go back to this picture, what passion flowers will do is early in the day, these stigmas will be up. Um, bees will come in, they'll start feeding on the nectar of the passion flower. Um, they pick up a pollen load and as the day progresses on, these will start to droop. Um, and as they start to droop, um, they'll be able to pick up pollen uh, from the back of carpenter bees. So the hopes is that um, they picked up pollen from another flower to help pollinate it. So again, you're avoiding cross pollination or self pollination, excuse me. Um, again, this is a really effective way of pollination. Um, you know, other insects could pollinate the passion flower as well, but the carpenter bee is most effective in actually being you know, to perform this function for this flower um, and for this plant. So, um, and it, again, anybody that's ever had a passion flower vine, you know how, <laughs> how easy it is to get passion flower uh, fruit or passion fruit from these vines because these guys do such a good job about pollinating them. And it's just a remarkable um, uh, relationship that they have with each other. Um, Another thing about the passion flower vine, and we talked about on that first slide when it comes to bees, is that they have to have a landing platform. 
and this is a perfect landing platform for a bee. Um, it's nice, big, wide, open, um, and brightly colored. It's got the blues and the purple hues in it, so it's again perfect for attracting uh, bees, certain types of bees and wasps. Um, but another one that we're going to look at is your catalpas, um, and this is the only picture that I have of a catalpa, but it does a great job about um, showing how effective plants are again for pollination and you can go out and catalpas are in bloom right now you can go look at a single bloom what will end up happening and again we said uh bees are attracted to yellow so you've got this yellow um uh, strip right here so bees are going to come in they're going to land on this platform and then the nectar is at the base of this flower so they're going to crawl on in here and that looks like if you look at this that's like the perfect fit for a honeybee or any sort of bee um, so they're crawling in there and then they're back out. And it, when they're doing that, if you look right here, you've got your stigmas and then your anthers are a little bit further in. So when they come in land, they brush against those stigmas first because they stick out a little bit further, pollinate it, get their treat, and then back on out. And when they're backing out, they pick up another load of uh, pollen from the anthers and they push that stigma up out of the way. So again, to avoid um, self-pollination and to ensure that they have a lot of diversity in their blooms. Um, so next plant we're going to look at or next um, insect we're going to look at or pollinator we're going to look at are beetles. Um, beetles are pretty effective pollinators as well. They don't pollinate a whole lot but what they do pollinate it is very important. Um, Again, if you look at this beetle, you can see where the majority of that hair is, or that fur, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's at the bottom of uh, the actual beetle itself. You don't have any up top like you do on honeybees, um, but it's all collected at the very base of the beetle. Um, so you're, that's going to tell you that, again, beetles are going to do their pollination when they're crawling over things. Um, so when you think of beetles again you think of probably more like uh, decomposers in the environment like flies um, but they're not necessarily attracted to that um, and anybody that has roses is very familiar with the japanese beetle because japanese beetles love um, roses so typically your your beetles are going to have bowl shaped um, sexual with the sexual organs exposed they're going to be white dull white or green um, they're going to have a strong fruity smell to them normally open during the day um, but they may also um, pollinate small clusters of flowers um, the other thing to keep in mind with beetles too is they're not going to be as delicate on flowers as your honeybees will or hummingbirds or butterflies or anything like that. Um, they're gonna be really, really clumsy uh, when it comes to pollination and moving around. I think everybody's see, watched a beetle and they like fall over on their back and they're just, they're just kind of goofy to watch them and they really have a hard time staying upright. But um, they, uh, they, that, that's what they're gonna need to actually effectively pollinate um, a, a flower. So first one um, is the tulip poplar. Um, if you look at the tulip poplar, uh, tulip poplar bloom, they're perfectly um, adapted to having beetles crawl around on them. You can see all your anthers here, they're all exposed, and then your stigma, um, and your actually ovary in the middle. So beetles are gonna come in, land on it, you're gonna crawl all over these, um, crawl over this, take a snack, eat the pollen, eat the, petals, all that stuff um, while pollinating um, these blooms. And um, if you don't like beetles, um, what, hopefully this will change your mind is that magnolias rely pretty heavily on beetles for pollination and they've adapted to having beetles um, pollinate them. And they're actually one of the first uh, effective pollinators um, when you when you look back at nature and how it's um, evolved and adapted and um, that sort of thing. So 
Um, you know, beetles make up the largest portion. I think they make up like 40% of all insects. Um, it may even be all animals on the planet. So um, for nature not to use beetles as a pollinator would just be um, not a smart move. So um, we do have them all over the place and they are important for uh, pollination. So these are not Japanese beetles. Um, they are the iridescent rose chafers. And as you can see on this magnolia, um, they're crawling all over the place, chewing up the leaves or the petals, chewing up, you don't have any anthers anymore. They either fell off or got ate. Um, and when you, you look at nature, um, one thing that we should keep in mind is that, especially when it comes to pest control in, the, in your landscape, um, beetles, I know we don't like them, uh, especially when they're eating your roses, but they're there doing their job in nature. They're fulfilling their role in nature. Um, and part of that is pollinating. And um, unfortunately, that comes with a sacrifice. Um, and sometimes that sacrifice is ruining the blooms. So um, it, it would be, um, what am I trying to say? So it, it would be great if just we could appreciate insects as much as the actual flowers um, and the entire life cycle that nature has um, and, and appreciate the entire uh, landscape and nature and how it all functions together instead of just the flowers. Um, the flowers are pretty, yes, but beetles and butterflies and all that stuff, um, they have their role. And I think we should um, lend some sort of appreciation to them as well um, because of their role in nature. So um, another thing that you'll notice in this picture, and generally, if you look at roses as well, um, when they start eating the petals and everything, they normally leave your stigma um, in the actual ovary intact. So they eat everything else. Um, and then you just have your uh, ovary so it can actually produce seed. Um, so again, I don't know why or how that works entirely, but beetles will avoid that. Um, and again, it may just be an adaption, adaptation with the magnolias and the beetles. Um, it must be, um, but it's, it's really important for their survival and passing down uh, genetics to the next generation. So um, next one, and if I'm running out of time, just let me know. I know it's 810 right now. Um, so just some, somebody tell me to rush through it if I need to. Um, the next one we're going to look at are butterflies and moths. And this is one that a lot of us um, know quite a bit about, just like uh, bees and wasps. Um, so, you know, when I, again, when I was doing research on this um, and preparing this uh, PowerPoint uh, for this evening, I was thinking, well, how do, how do butterflies actually pollinate because they stand generally really high off of the flower. And I didn't really think of them being as furry insects, but you can see they do have a lot of hair. And generally what, what ends up happening is that the proboscis on the butterfly does the pollination. Um, so butterflies will, uh, when they stick their proboscis down into a bloom or flower, um, it'll pick up pollen but they also do it intentionally and unintentionally um, because butterflies will actually consume um, and put their saliva on some of the pollen and actually consume pollen as well. A lot of people, and I know I did as well, when you think of a butterfly, you think of it just feeding on the nectar and going after the sugary stuff, but they also rely on um, a lot of other resources as well. Um, fun fact about butterflies, um, and it may change your opinion on them, is that they um, will actually consume uh, like mud, urine, feces, blood, um, and even decaying flesh, much like flies. Um, and I, I know I've seen it myself, but you just never really think about it. If you go to a horse farm, you do see butterflies that will accumulate on manure. Um, and the reason why they do that is because they need the resources and the salts and 
um, all, all the, the nutrients out of that more so than just, just nectar itself. Um, so they do do a little decomposing as well, just like beetles and flies and that sort of thing. So um, just because they're pretty to look at doesn't mean they live a glorious, nice, clean, healthy life. <laughs> um, they also do something called a, a butterfly puddle party, um, which is kind of a funny name for it. But if you get a chance, look that up because um, they um, do sap or collect in especially sandy patches. So if you want to attract butterflies, you can put sand out, fill it with water, and they'll come in and take the salt out of the, the sand. Um, but generally, they do it after rain. So anyways, um, typically, butterflies, they're going to visit uh, blooms that are red, yellow, orange, um, and those sorts of hues. Um, they're going to be open during the day. They do produce, they do eat a lot of nectar, um, but they also consume some of the other things that I've just mentioned. Um, they typically like um, small clusters of flowers. So if you look at milkweed or coneflower or something like that, um, they're, they're going to want something like that. Uh, moss, on the other hand, they tend to take third shift. Um, they're actually more efficient pollinators because they tend to be fuzzier and sit a lot closer to the flowers that they're landing on um, compared to the butterflies, which kind of sit up generally off of flowers, uh, kind of like they're sitting on stilts. Um, interesting fact about moths as well is that they tend to carry pollen a lot further than bees do. So you can get a lot more genetic diversity when it comes to uh, moth pollination than you do in bee pollination. Um, so here's a monarch butterfly. A lot of people are familiar with it. Um, you kind of see how high he sits um, up off of that balloon. Um, I mean, you kind of see down here where he's in contact with it, but for the most part, his head and the fuzziest parts of them are going to sit higher. And generally, they're going to take that pollen out with the proboscis um, and transport it that way. So um, there's a great example. Um, another one I wanted to mention as well, the hummingbird moth. Um, this is the larval stage of it. So um, this is a type of a hornworm. Um, and as I've previously mentioned that, um, or the reason why I have this picture in here is because as I was mentioning when we were talking about beetles, a lot of people, when they see an insect, they look at it and they just think it's bad because it's consuming their plants. Um, and they don't think about the, necessarily the entire life cycle of the, the caterpillar or the beetle or anything like that. Um, so they see something out ruining their garden and they just come out and kill it, but they don't think about the next stages um, in that insect's life cycle. Um, and we're coming in and killing a lot of our caterpillars, which are effective um, or would be effective pollinators. So um, not having a squeaky clean landscape um, is always the best answer. Um, it's actually really bad for your landscape if you don't have any insects or anything like that in it. Um, hey, hey, Nick. Yeah. We are at about 8.15. I just want to make sure, uh, yeah. just leave time for some questions that might come up. So Okay. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll speed through this. I've got, I think, two more uh, uh, things I want to go through. So, um, so this is a example of a hummingbird moth, which is the adult stage of your uh, hornworm. Um, again, super effective pollinator. If you get a chance, do a little research on them. They do mimic hummingbirds um, to avoid uh, being attacked by predators. Um, next one I want to touch on, and I think it's the last one, are ma mammals. Um, and they make up about 9% of pollinators. And um, so some of the things that um, I'm, I'm going to show, I'm just going to skip through some of these really quick. Um, so here's a really good picture of how effective hummingbirds are and how well plants have manipulated um, insects and animals to um, help with pollination. This is a cardinal flower. And as this hummingbird comes in here, takes a sip, um, it will uh, basically deposit uh, pollen on the forehead of that hummingbird, it'll fly away, and then come back in and do it again, and spreading that pollen around. So this is, again, a perfect example of how 
specific um, uh, pollination techniques can actually be. Um, this next picture is an, just another really good example of it. I mean, that hummingbird comes in and you've got your, your uh, stigma here and your anthers here. Um, and it's just petting it on the head, um, depositing its pollen and it'll fly away. And then next time it comes in, it'll deposit it on the uh, stigma first. Um, I'm just gonna skip this one because um, it's basically the same idea. Um, last one I'm gonna talk about is actually bats. Um, bats are incredibly effective pollinators, just like hummingbirds are. Um, as you can see, this guy right here, he's got his face full of um, just food and there's pollen mixed in there as well. Um, but this next picture is gonna really demonstrate how effective bats are. Um, I mean, they're really furry, um, so they can hold a lot of pollen. Um, this is actually a cigarro cactus bloom. He sticks his head down in there. Um, his tongue's getting ready to go out and we'll see that in the next picture to uh, suck up some nectar. Um, and as he does that, he's sticking his head in all these um, anthers, which are depositing pollen on his head. And then your stigma is the first thing that's furthest out. So um, it again avoids uh, cross pollination or self pollination. Um, here's a, um, another really good example of it. And this one's similar to the, to the hummingbird to where you've got your reproductive organs on the outside, depositing it on the head. Um, and then down here, you could see the ovary of that plant. So, um, you could see how far that pollen tube actually needs to form once it's, uh, once it's actually deposit, once the pollen's deposited. Um, and it does that, like I said, within just a couple hours, which is a little tiny speck of pollen. So, all right. Um, so the last thing I want to leave you with um, uh, before we take questions is um, just this quote. Um, uh, it goes over the, or just basically mentions the worth, the economic value of pollinators. Um, but it basically says pollinators from honeybees, native bees, and flies delivers billions of dollars in economic value anywhere between uh, 235 and 577 billion dollars uh, worth of global food pr production relies on their contribution. So we need to take care of our pollinators, um, not go out to sterilize our landscape, um, and we need to learn to work with insects, not against them, and appreciate every stage of life. So. Um, that's all I have for you. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, and I guess we will um, open this up to some questions. Thank you. Hey, Nick, I, it's Casey. I have a quick question to kind of kick this off real quick. Yeah. Uh, you hear a lot about, uh, obviously, with pesticides and the uh, detriment they have on pollinators are uh, uh, one of the most widely used ones, obviously, is glyphosate. What? What is I, I know like your your metaclopridin and things like that are very detrimental. A lot of beneficial pollinators. What about like the glyphosate and the impacts that that has on on um, pollinators? Do you have Do you know of much? I, that question gets asked to me quite often, and I just yeah maybe no, I have an opinion on that. Yeah, it's I mean it's a good question. I I really don't know how um, herbicides actually affect pollinators. Um, cause generally what, what we deal with is how insecticides affect pollinators because that's what they're designed to kill. Um, so I, I don't know, Casey, that's, that's a good question. I may be able to get some answers for that for you, but as okay. of right now, I, I, I not, not, not trying to throw you on the spot. I just, <laughs> no, you're uh, good. I, it's, it's one that I, I, I need to probably do a little bit more. It just seems like anytime, you know, anytime, uh, 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 a pesticide, whether it's an insecticide, herbicide, or whatever it may be, it's automatically people start asking about pollinators, Maybe. and so without really much thought behind it. So yeah, and and I feel like when you mention pesticide to you, a lot of people don't understand that there's different types of pesticides. Like under pesticides, you've got insecticides, miticides, and uh, herbicides, and all those other sides. And pesticides are just a broad, like broad, like spectrum to it's kind of a catch-all for all those. So it, it may just be, we're not, I mean, people just don't know any better what the difference is between them too. But I've, 
um, I can I can talk to my entomologist um, up at the lab and kind of pick his brain a little bit and get back to you on that because I'm sure he'd know. Appreciate it. All Thanks, right, Nick. I, I, oh, sorry. Cool. I think we have a, a comment. I think Lee is um, also willing to work on that question. And then we have a question here in tree pollination. Is there a relationship between wind happening and wind pollination beginning? Wind happening. And yeah, and Jim, feel free to unmute yourself and ask that question if you want to. Yeah, if I could get a little bit more clarification on that. Yeah, I was interested. To, can you hear me? Yes, you can. I was interested to know if there's a relationship between wind beginning and pollination release beginning, or does pollination release happen all the time? And it just depends on sporadic wind carrying the pollen. Yeah, yeah. so um, the pollen needs to mature in the anther first, and then the anther will open and wait for wind to take it. I'm not sure if that answers your question, um, but like if you look back at that video that we, we looked at, yeah, um, you know, that that tree was just loaded with pollen. Um, a lot of them probably opened at the right time and it just wasn't very windy um, up to that point. So it just wasn't released and actually taken away at that or before that video was taken. Does that answer your question? Well, um, I don't know, but I think <laughs> I got it. What, what you're saying is that the, pollinate, the pollen is not necessarily released as in, uh, expelled by the anther, but it's just sitting there waiting for the right. wind to carry it. Right. Okay. Yes. yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Great job, Nick. Thanks for covering a bunch of species. Um, so we see mast in oak species. Have you ever seen some resemblance of a mast on say a birch or another wind pollinated species like of course, pecan or birch. I've not, uh, honestly, I've not paid a whole lot of attention to, to birch trees, um, uh, especially when it comes to uh, pollen release or seed production because they're just so small um, that we really don't think about it. On like pecan, um, I, I've, I've seen mast years like that, just like an acorn or an oak tree would as well to where some years it's just really, really bad. You've got more pecans than what you can even think to do with and what you can give away or do anything like that. So yeah, I do, I do believe that um, pecans and uh, do you have mast years just like your oaks would. And do you think that's just like a perfect storm for say where the conditions are right that allows abundant pollination or I think some of it has, yeah, that may be part of it, but I think a lot of it has to do with genetics too. Um, Cause like your white oaks, for example, not all oaks have a mast year, but your white oaks are particularly bad or renowned for having um, a mast year. Not so much your red oak species. Your red oak species are just more consistent in their, um, in their crop production every year. So that's great. Thank you. Like I said, yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, genetics more than anything on that. Great, thank you. And we have a question here from Jim again. How do ants transfer trillium seeds? Uh, well, they, so it's my understanding that they actually feed on the seeds. Um, so they, in carrying them back to their um, their colony, um, they're not going to consume all of them, and some of them by default sprout kind of like a squirrel with ac acorns. You know, squirrels will hide a bunch of acorns or plant them and um, forget about some of them or not eat all of them, and then you have acorns popping up all over the place. So it's a similar, um, similar system, just on a much smaller scale. Okay, are there any more questions? Again, feel free to unmute yourself to ask those questions or put them in the chat.
I think we're good. Nick, that was really excellent. There was so much information in that. I'm glad we got that recorded. <laughs> Sorry, it took so long. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about that, but hopefully yeah, everybody enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely one of those where you'll go back and listen again because there was just so much, it was packed with so much information. I learned a lot too. I don't like that I'm eating wasps when I'm eating figs. So, <laughs> all right. So thank you everyone for being here. And um, with that, I'm going to stop recording.